Good afternoon. Thanks for joining Family Caregiver Alliance for fighting for, not with, your loved one's health care professionals. I'm Calvin Hu, Education Coordinator at FCA and your host for today. For four decades, FCA has been working across the Bay Area and the nation to improve the well-being of family caregivers. We offer support through consultations, classes, workshops, retreats, publications, and advocacy. To learn more about FCA or access our online resource center, CareNav, please visit us at caregiver.org. So during the webinar, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A box on your screen. Um, your phones or mics are going to be muted. We'll uh, answer as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar. And we're also going to be asking to provide a little bit of feedback. So I'd like to thank you all in advance for filling that out. Finally, the webinars are going to be archived, so um, if you have to leave early for any reason, we do um, get them archived to our YouTube channel later on. So today I'd like to welcome our guest, Dr. Barry J. Jacobs. Barry is a clinical psychologist, healthcare consultant, and a monthly columnist on family caregiving for AARP.org. He's also the author of Emotional Survival Guide for Caregivers, Looking After Yourself and Your Family While Helping an Aging Parent. And he's a co-author of AARP Meditations for Caregivers, Practical, Emotional, and Spiritual Support for You and Your Family. Um, Barry is also the author of um, the AARP Love and Meaning for Couples After 50, The 10 Challenges to Great Relationships and How to Overcome Them. Barry is also a national spokesperson on family caregiving for the American Heart Association. So now that you know uh, a little bit more about today's presenter, I'd like to turn things over to Barry. Uh, thank you so much, Calvin, and thank you all for being here. It's really my pleasure to, to be here with you. Uh, and uh, just a, a couple more words about myself, and then we'll, we'll talk about uh, what, what we're going to what we're going to be discussing today. So I'm a psychologist, uh, but as you'll hear during our, our uh, presentation today, I've also been a family caregiver. Um, I was a family caregiver for my stepfather who had Alzheimer's disease and my mother who had vascular dementia. Uh, and so I've been on kind of both sides of, of, of uh, the issue that we're discussing today. So I've, I've been the healthcare professional working with family members in primary care, in hospitals, um, in, uh, in behavioral health clinics. Um, but I've also been that family caregiver uh, sitting there in, in, in the, the primary care office or neurologist office or the cardiologist office, listening to the doctor, talking with my family member, and really being dissatisfied with, um, with, with how the doctor was explaining things or, um, or, or the lack of, 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 uh, of caring that, that sometimes occurred. Uh, and so, I, you know, one of the, the things that I like to talk about is this topic. How do we help family caregivers figure out a way to partner with healthcare professionals to, to, so that we work with them. We don't feel that they've pushed us out. We don't feel like they're working against us or we're working against them, but that we're working together. So that's the point of today's, uh, today's presentation. And, and I'm hoping this is gonna be a conversation. Um, uh, next slide, please, Calvin. So, so let me tell you what I have in mind today um, and you know, one question that often comes up, especially for healthcare professionals, is, is you know, we're, we're all, you know, healthcare professionals are, are you know, lectured constantly that they need to be patient centered or person centered, and that their focus is, is sometimes laser like on, on, on the patient to the exclusion of the family member. And so, why should healthcare professionals pay more attention to families? So, we'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk a little bit about that. And we'll talk about what has been, I think, uh, historically an, an uneasy relationship between family caregivers and healthcare professionals, uneasy for um, a number of reasons, which we'll discuss. And then even despite that history, there are many things that family caregivers can do to build that trusting relationship uh, with, with, with a, a physician, with a nurse uh, that uh, will matter in the long run not just for the family caregiver's sake, but for the sake of, of, of the loved one that you're caring for. Um, and then uh, what we really ideally want, I believe, is for family caregivers to become partners with, with the healthcare team, to really be a trusted member of that healthcare team. Uh, and when you are, you know, when you feel like you're, you're part of the team, it's a good feeling. It, it, you feel like they trust you, you trust them, you're all working together. 
everybody's pulling in the same direction. So uh, that, that's what I have in mind today. Hopefully that, that's what you have in mind as well. Uh, next slide, please. So I, I, I wanna try to make this as much of a conversation as possible and we, we can't unmute the, the phones because we, we just have too many folks uh, on the line, uh, which is a good thing. Um, but so we're gonna make good use of the chat box. Um, and so here's, here, I have two things I'd like you to do. Um, and I'd like you to take a moment to on a one to 10 basis, where one is a very bad experience and 10 is a very good experience, please give a number that would rate your experience working with your loved ones, healthcare professionals. Has it been terrible? So I, I'm already starting to see some in there. Uh, I see sevens, I see eights, I see eights, I see three, I see another eight, four. Um, I, I see numbers, uh, really ranging uh, all over the place. Um, I actually see quite a number that are that are quite good, um, and that's that's good. I see a nine, uh, and and then I see a, th a three. So um, it's 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 clear from what you've put in. Um, uh, so Janet writes some it's a two, for others it's an eight or a nine. And I I think Janet, your point is well taken that there are some healthcare professionals that seem to be more inclined to work collaboratively with with family caregivers and they you know they they get the high marks they get the eight or the nine and there are some others that may pay no attention to the family member and they get a two or a three um so and lisa jean writes the same thing four to uh, four to nine depending um and then someone just had it in their luck of the draw all right i get i get the idea what we're talking about is a real variety of experiences uh, and i i got to imagine that um when, when you have that eight or nine, uh, that really good experience, then um, that's, a, that's a good feeling. And then when you, have a t when you have an experience with a healthcare provider in the two to three range, that's a pretty frustrating experience. All right, so here's my second question for you. And this one's a little, a little harder. Um, and Gina Wright's been quite frustrating and stressful. I, I, I believe you, Gina, that's what I'm here for today to talk about this. But here's my second question for you. Name one or two things that prevent family caregivers and healthcare professionals from being a good good partners. So, uh, you know, for instance, is it that they don't have enough time together? Is it that they don't listen to one another? Is it that healthcare professionals are not interested in the family family members' point of view? All right. So, Ellen writes limited time during the visit. That's certainly a big one. Uh, Tara writes. I, I see. Abby writes lack of communication. Uh, that's a big one. Uh, uh, fighting with siblings, managing expectations. Um, doctors are busy. That, that's one of the main things we're going to be talking about. Uh, I saw Christine Jensen's name in there. Um, it's hard to, uh, arrogance, mm, think they know best. Okay. They already put your loved one, uh, okay. Office staff as gatekeepers. Really interesting comment, Joan. And I can tell you, I worked in primary care for 24 years and absolutely the front desk is not there to welcome people and help them talk to doctors. They're there to, to keep doc people away from the doctor. So I agree with you. Uh, Leilani writes, PCP doesn't care. I didn't get to go in. Uh, that's, that's really unfortunate. Um, so there are many, many comments here, again, with a range of experiences. Uh, let, me, let me see if I can capture just a couple more. Um, Jennifer writes, patients treated differently when alone versus family member present. That's an interesting comment, and I'm, I'm sure that's true. And maybe the doctors are on their best behavior when the family is around. Christine Jensen writes, provider not aware of dementia, assume it's simply due to aging. That's a very frustrating circumstance. Uh, and then, uh, you know, are they receptive to when you say, I think my loved one has dementia, and, and they, or do they, they defend uh, their, their judgment of the patient and say, no, the patient's fine? Jennifer points out, again, providers don't have enough time. That's certainly true. Uh, Bonnie says different focus toward treatment goals. So that is, so sometimes not even uh, that there's differences in communication or not enough time, but maybe they're looking at different things. Uh, so these are, these are some great ideas that folks are putting here. Debbie writes, doctor sees a, a different thing in the person compared to what a caregiver tells him. Um, and that, Debbie, often is, 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 is because the caregiver is with the person all the time and the doctor gets this little kind of keyhole view, a very short and very limited, narrow view. 
And the doctor then makes makes all kinds of judgments about the patient limited based on that limited view. And, and really, in, in my opinion, the caregiver often knows best. Uh, and Anna writes, uh, the caregivers, uh, the, the doctors don't seem to know about palliative care. And that is changing in, in, in the world of medicine, but that, that is true. Okay, these are all great. And I think we're, we're be, you've begun to, to kind of flesh out some of the issues that we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about communication, we're going to talk about time, uh, and then what, what we really need to talk a lot about is trust. Okay, next slide, please. So just to kind of set the large frame here, and I think most of you already know this, uh, there are a lot of us family caregivers in the world right now, or naturally a lot in this country. So as, as of the last large family caregiver survey that was done in 2020, there are about 53 million Americans uh, who are engaging in some form of caregiving activity in, in, you know, in, in, in the course of a year. And that means about one in five uh, American adults have been uh, either uh, an occasional family caregiver or a caregiver on an ongoing basis. And that number 53 million is increasing because our population is, is really uh, getting older um, and, it's, and it's also increasing because uh, people live longer with medical conditions that years ago, 40, 30, 40 years ago, uh, would have shortened their lives. So people live longer with heart disease, people live longer with, um, with cardi cardiac disease, excuse me, or with cancer, and they live longer even with dementia, but they don't live longer whole and self-sufficient. They live longer with the kind of functional deficits for which they need help. And that help is primarily coming from family members. Uh, next slide, please. So when somebody come, becomes a family member, a lot of times they're not quite, they don't really know what they're getting into. And I have to say, even, even having been a healthcare professional many years, when I became a family caregiver, even I didn't know all the different roles I was going to have to play. So here is a, you know, a, a list of, of, of roles uh, so you may play some, you may play all, you may play more than it's on this list, but this is a list I put together with, with uh, Jennifer Wolf years ago. So what do we do as caregivers? We're, well, we're certainly the companion to our loved one. Uh, we're, there, we're driving them back and forth. Uh, we're, uh, we may be um, you know, taking care of all their bills and insurance forms. Um, and Lisa Jean read, wrote, you left that cook and your point is well taken. Um, we're also, I, I think that we, we become a navigator through the, at least the gene also says, and housekeeper, thank you. Um, and, you know, I've, obviously I've left out some important things on this list. Um, uh, so we sit in the, in the doctor's office and we're listening to what the doctor says. And then we know we're going to have to take whatever the doctor said and, and then share that information with other family members. So that we become a kind of technical interpreter, listening for what the doctor says, trying to understand it and then be able to convey it in a way that the rest of the family is gonna understand. And at the, but at the same time, we want the doctor to understand who our loved one is if our loved one really can't speak for, for him or herself very well any longer. And that means we wanna help them understand what, what their preferences are, what, what their, their moods are like, what their behavior is like. So we become kind of this point person between the, the doctor and the patient and trans, translating uh, back and forth between the two. We're also, and I found this to be the case, we also wind up being a kind of case manager at times, because even though uh, doctors all use electronic medical records and on that electronic medical record, there's supposed to be all sorts of information and they can, you know, from all sorts of different specialists and then they can read it all in one place. What I found um, in the years that I took care of my mother in particular is the, the, the electronic medical record was never up to date. So if my mother had just seen her cardiologist or just seen her neurologist, then when I went to the primary care doctor, he had no idea who my mother had just seen or, or the fact that she had just gotten out, not gotten out of the hospital for, after having had a fall. And so, you know, I became the person who I had to inform him of everything that was going on, the change of medicines, uh, et, et cetera. And then as, uh, as we'll talk, uh, family caregivers, do end up doing a lot of what really is amounts to healthcare. Uh, next slide, please. So many of you probably saw this report that came out in, in 2019 from AARP. Uh, it was called Home Alone Revisited. And it basically said that um, 
uh, and and uh, Anne Marie would you know you put a really interesting comment there. We need our own charting. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. Um, Home Alone Revisited found in their in its conclusions that half of the nation's at that time forty million family caregivers uh, were performing what is essentially medical tasks. They were performing. Um, they were giving injections. They were preparing special diets for their loved ones. They were managing tube feedings, which which means that not, not only are they, um, uh, you know, putting putting uh, uh, nutrition in the tube, but they're having to flush the tube regularly and, and maintain the tube the site, uh, you know, the tube site so that this, you don't get irrita skin irritation. And they were handling medical equipment. And what I don't see in the list here, but but is true for almost every caregiver, uh, is is we manage medicines, and and sometimes we manage we manage multiple medicines, sometimes piles of medicines that a loved one may have to take in the course of the day, and we have to sometimes provide uh, you know twice a day dosing, three times a day dosing with some of those medicines, and so that that's a it means that a lot of caregivers are at home doing what what is essentially medical care uh, for for their loved ones. So to me, you know, in terms of that question of why family matters to, to, to healthcare professionals, so why, why family, family members should matter is because family members are doing all, a lot of healthcare in the home that, that is gonna keep the patient safe and keep the patient as well as possible. And that's, that's what the healthcare system is trying to do too. And so without family members taking on these tasks, um, I, I don't know where, you know, how healthcare professionals would be able to achieve their, their outcomes. Uh, uh, Sherry Wright writes, I, I believe that more funding is needed to support current caregiver support organizations. I agree with you, Sherry. Um, but we're, what we're gonna talk about today is what caregivers can do to, to, uh, to, to do a better, to do as good a job as possible with their medical task as part of a medical team, as, part, as partners with the healthcare team. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. And then just to kind of make this argument further, there's actually a lot of research that suggests that when family members are involved in a loved one's care, that they, they do better medically, that, that as, as, as good as a family caregiver does, then the patient does well. So a, a really, um, really well-known um, example is this first one here that in about 40% of primary care visits, there is a family member present. And, and so, you know, you can imagine if you're caring for your parents, you spend time going to the doctor's office, sitting there and that other, you know, the patient's in one chair, you're in another. And then you find that, uh, that there's, uh, the doctor either is paying attention to you or not paying attention to you or talking only to the patient or talking only to you. You know, I found I found both happen when I was sitting in the doctor's office as a family member with with my mom. Sometimes the doctor totally ignored me, which really irritated me, and sometimes the doctor would only talk to me, which only, which really irritated my mom. But in any event, Jennifer Wolf, who's a, epi, a public health epidemiologist at Johns Hopkins University, had a series of studies which found that if there's a family member at the, at the medical visit, that the, the, the quality of that medical visit is better. And um, that means that the doctor is more happy with the visit and the patient's happy with the visit. That questions get asked, information gets exchanged, there's greater understanding of, 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 at the end and greater consensus at the end of the visit about how the, they're all gonna go forward. And then the, there are other, uh, there are other uh, research results like that, whether it be about diabetes or post-stroke or dementia, having family involved means patients do better. So again, an argument for why family matters. Family matters to healthcare. Next slide, please. So, you know, I have a little bit of a joke here, and it says it takes three to tango, because uh, you know, I and mean, I'm not the first person to, to point this out, but really, what we're talking about is a triangle or a three-legged stool, and, and and so it's not just what goes on between the the provider and the patient. When a family member is, uh, is is involved with helping the patient, this really is a three is a triangle. It's a three legged stool, where the clinician, the patient, and the family have to have to find ways of working together. Um, the clinician can't make believe the family member is invisible; they're not there because that's just not the reality. Nor nor can the patient uh, allow that either if the family member is is really involved in their care. 
Um, so I see many comments. Let me just take a moment to just, just scan at them. I'm not gonna be able to read them all, but just to read a few of them. Um, uh, caregivers should document and keep folders or some type of system to stay abreast of the issues of their loved one. And that's an excellent suggestion. I'm gonna talk more about that in a minute. In a minute. Sometimes I feel that the office staff does not have an understanding that a family member may be present. That is true. So what we're talking about today is not just partnering with the, 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 the physician or, or the nurse practitioner, but the office staff needs to understand um, that, that uh, you, you're part and parcel of, of the whole caregiving plan. And in, in, in GJ rates, not all family are legally recognized. And that, that too is an issue, um, whether it be um, that, uh, I mean, from a legal standpoint, and it depend, this depends on the state, uh, uh, you know, whether what, what your status is varies, but we're not going to get into the legal issue so much today. We're going to really talk about more about developing that, that partnership relationship with healthcare professionals. Okay, let's go on. All right. So let's, let's look at the, each leg of the, that three-legged stool. And let's talk about physicians first. So there was a very famous article in the care, you know, in the caregiving literature uh, that, that published in 1999, that uh, was uh, uh, written, uh, published in a, in a very well-known uh, medical journal called the Annals of Internal Medicine. This is kind of the prime journal for, uh, for internal medicine docs. And it was an article called The Trouble with Families. And, and here is a quote from this article. And, and the art quote is, a persistent tendency to equate families with trouble is evident in both the literature and practice of medicine. So historically, there was a lot of almost negative feeling towards family members that they were just going to disrupt the care somehow. And this is, this is back in 1999. And I think, the, you know, I, I'm hoping we do better in, in 2021. As a matter of fact, I believe we do better, but I don't think physician attitudes are, are all they could be. Next slide, please. So if you, if you ask a physician today, um, about having, you know, working with the family caregiver as well as the patient, um, you know, you'll get a variety of opinions, but you're going to get some negative opinions. So here's some of the negative opinions you're going to hear. So there are physicians who will tell you that if I involve the family caregiver, that I'm somehow uh, undermining the, the patient's autonomy and right to confidentiality, that I'm going to be practicing unethically because my, you know, my first duty is to the patient and my first ethical responsibility is to keep the patient's uh, information confidential and, um, and, and to make sure that the patient is in charge of his or her own care. Um, and so the answer to that is obviously, if you get the patient's permission to involve, uh, involve the family caregiver, then there's no issues with HIPAA or confidentiality. And secondly, having the family member involved doesn't mean that the family member steps in and takes over and, and the patient has no say so anymore over what happens to them. A second physician attitude is uh, that involving the family member alters the quality of the patient professional relationship. And in, and in medicine and particularly in primary care, this, this idea of the, the doctor patient relationship is being sacrosanct as being something that you know, is, is, needs to be cherished above all of, uh, other things. And that, that somehow gets sullied by, by bringing a family member in. Uh, to me, this is overblown. Uh, and, and I can say that having worked in, in primary care for a long time, uh, I it does change the, the, the doctor patient relationship when there's a third person involved, a family caregiver, but it doesn't undermine it ne negatively. And then uh, the physician might also say, working with families takes additional time and is unreimbursed. And here we may, we may have some attitudes which are a little closer to, to, uh, to, to, to something reality based. And that is, does it take additional time when a family member is sitting in the room? Well, when Jennifer Wolf did her, her research about family presence and medical visits. She found that it took five additional minutes if a family member sat in the room, that there was more conversation and so the visit went on longer. And so then the question becomes, well, is, are those five additional minutes worthwhile to the physician and to the patient if the quality of the visit is better? And I would argue yes. And then there's the issue of for family, for, um, for the, the physicians, if they spend time alone with the family member, that time is unreimbursed. 
So there's one Medicare code that they, they can use once in the lifetime of a patient where they would get reimbursed some small amount for talking with a family member. Um, and especially, uh, and then there's, there are other codes for talking about end of life care with family members. But generally speaking, um, the, the time doctors spend with family members is unreimbursed. And that for some, that's an issue. For others, that means basically, okay, this is, it's unreimbursed, but this is the right thing to do. And this is what's gonna be best for the patient. And so I'm gonna do it. But, but here are some physician attitudes that get in the way. Next slide, please. There are some patient attitudes that get in, in the way of, the, of that, of, of that three-legged stool. And so, you know, especially uh, patients who are still relatively sound mind and, and, you know, who don't want, say, an adult child involved or a spouse involved, they may say, I'm capable of going to the doctor by myself. I don't need you sitting in, in my doctor's office. I want to spend the time with my doctor by myself, and I have a right to privacy with my doctor. And they may even go further in saying that when my kids insist on coming into the doctor with me to, to express their point of view, I resent it. My kids are trying to take over my life. They have no right to, um, to, to, to sully my, you know, to, to interfere with my relationship with my doctor. So that's a patient attitude that, that makes it, it actually puts physicians in a very difficult position because they, maybe they even want to talk with the family caregiver, but if the patient doesn't give them permission or encouragement to do so, then, they, then they're going to feel really leery about even trying it. Uh, next slide, please. And then frankly, there are family caregiver attitudes that can get into, uh, in, 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 can, can uh, interfere with that, that three-legged stool. And so sometimes family members will say, I talk directly to the doctor and nurse about my mother's condition. She doesn't need to know what's, what's going on. I don't want to upset her. So they can just talk with me and, and my mother doesn't, you know, my mother can be, can be left in the dark. And this is, by the way, you know, what is normal in, in some other cultures. But in American culture, where um, we have such, an, in, uh, such a strong emphasis on, on individual autonomy, that written into the professional ethical codes, the, the, the professionals must keep the patient informed if, if they have the cognitive capability of understanding what's going on. And so this idea that the, the, the caregiver and the, and the professional are going to talk and the patient's going to be cut out of that picture, that doesn't fly very well. And then there are family caregivers that say, and maybe, and maybe rightfully so, I just don't trust that my doctors really understand what's going on with my mother and, 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 and really know what's, what, what, what to do to help her. And I can figure out what's best for her. I know better than the doctors than, than what the, what the, uh, the than, I know better than the doctors than what, what my mother needs right now. And so the caregiver sometimes may, um, kind of countervene the, the, the treatment plan. You're going to say, I don't, I don't think she needed this pill. I think instead, we'll, 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 I won't give you that pill. And, and that drives doctors crazy, I can assure you. So here are some of the barriers. And I see there's a very active conversation going on in the chat box, which is great. Um, but let me, let me see if I can read at least some of this. Uh, Aaron says the doctor really appreciated the time spent beforehand to address issues by email, and she was better able to direct the treatment and tone of the visit. Aaron, you're a couple steps ahead of me, but certainly I'm glad to hear you say that. Um, uh, Andrea says, caregivers can still legally tell the MD significant info that they need to know. And that's absolutely true. And I have said this myself to many of my ca family caregiver clients over the years. The physician may say to them, I can't tell you anything. I can't talk to you. And that's fine. But if you give them information then they can listen. They, that, that doesn't break confidentiality to listen to you, especially if you're, you're sharing something that's pretty important, like my mother is falling or my mother is very confused at night or my mother won't take her medicine as prescribed. Uh, that's all really important information for a physician to know. Sometimes that information can be conveyed over the phone. Better is to convey it in some sort of written form, like an email or a letter, because anything written is then going to become part of the chart. And once it becomes part of the medical chart, the, the healthcare professional, from a legal standpoint, will have to pay more attention to it. So these are some great, great comments. Let, let's, let's go on. All right. And I'm going to just share with you my own caregiving experience. And, and the photo here is my mom on the right. 
Um, and this was while she was still living in her apartment, but she had vascular dementia. And we, we had seven or eight hours of the day of, of a home care uh, attendant with her. And this is her, the attendant, uh, Mary, who she loved, who was with her for about a year. But what I found with my mom, and this gets back to the communication issues people brought up before, is there was the communication was really hard because my mother had uh, like a whole host of, of different healthcare providers. She had a, a, a neurologist, she had a psychiatrist, she had a primary care doctor, she had a, a psychotherapist. Sometimes she had uh, evaluations by a neuropsychologist. When she would come out of the hospital and she had home health for a while, and then she had a home nurse and she had home PT and home OT. She even had home uh, had, had speech therapist. And then she had home health aides. Uh, coming in and out of the house. And, and Mary was there a lot, but then we had a whole kind of revolving door of home health aides. And then my mother used adult daycare services. So, you know, I'm sure many of you have, have also had this experience that I had, that there's lots of different folks helping our loved one and they don't talk to one another. They're supposed to talk to one another. They're supposed to exchange information, but they don't. And that means that it's almost like you have to be the, the point person to, to, to share information with all of them, but it becomes really confusing uh, working with them. Uh, next slide, please. And I'll tell you one other story. And this is, this is a, a little later picture of my mom after she had stopped dyeing her hair. Um, and this was about a month before she, she died uh, four years ago next month. Um, so when, when my mother would go to the primary care office, um, the first few times I took her in, she really resented my being there because um, I would kind of rat my mom out. I would tell, tell the doctor, my mom's been falling. Um, I think you need to look at her meds. Maybe when she needs to have physical therapy and my, we would leave the office and my mother would be furious at me that I told the doctor she had been falling. And even sometimes in front of the doctor, she would deny falling, even though it's, it's like she was saving face in front of the doctor um, in a way which, which, to me, it didn't make sense, but that, that's what she wanted to do. So um, my mother was angry and she wanted to maintain control over her life as long as she could. And that meant she wanted to, to maintain control over her doctor's appointments. She didn't want me, you know, harping in on, on her time with her doctor. And then in the doctor's office, she would be arguing with me over, did she fall? Did she not fall? Was she taking her medicines the way she should? Did she not uh, take her medicines as she should? Uh, thank you, Lisa Jean, for saying my mother looked great. She did look great, but like I said, this is about a month before she died um, and she was quite ill at the end. So while my mother and I would be arguing in front of the doctor, the doctor would look at us like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? I don't know what to do with these people. Uh, he didn't want to exclude me because I was providing really important information to him. But the, at the same time, he didn't want to alienate my mom. Because if he kept, if he just had me there all the time, then my mom wouldn't want to see him anymore. And that's the truth. She had to be able to trust him and he needed to have a way to, to, to get information from me. So this was, an, again, an, another example of where, of where the, 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 that three-legged stool, those, those three partners weren't working well together because my mom and I weren't working well together and that made it harder for, for her physician. We'll get back to this situation uh, toward the end of our presentation. Next slide, please. So let me ask, you know, you guys are using the chat box in a wonderful way. And so here's another opportunity to do that. So what, what you've already, I see many of you have already put this in the chat box, but maybe uh, some of you who haven't spoken up so far could do this. What advice would you give family caregivers to work effectively with healthcare providers and the care receiver? In other words, how, do, how can you, uh, what, what's, what, what's within your power to do to make that triangle uh, work well? So Carmen writes, document communications. Um, other, it's a great idea. Uh, sending emails is an effective way of documenting communications. Uh, Ellen points out that's, that's great, especially with a healthcare professional. Um, uh, uh, Ramona says, listen carefully. Uh, listen carefully to, to the doctor, but also hopefully listen carefully to the care receiver. Lisa Jean says, uh, I kind of lost, things are going by too quickly here. And I think I lost you, okay, let me, Constance says, be prepared and focus on most, um, 
and I just lost the last of that rest of the constants. It's scroll, scrolling too quickly for me. Lisa Jean, as time of day appointment is input for daddy's attitude. Uh, yes, and that, so it's important for the doctor to know that. GJ says, recognize your own limitations and strength, document and for everything and learn how to be brief. Great advice. You know, brevity is a virtue. So good, wonderful advice. We're going to talk more about this in just a second. Um, Edlinda says, gently stressing to clinician and patient that you have only the patient's best interest at heart. Excellent advice. Uh, I'm going to talk more about that. Judy says, I had a card made up saying that mom, uh, to, uh, mom has some dementia is not necessarily an accurate reporter of the symptoms and conditions. I give it to whomever leads us into the exam room for all doc, new doctors and then communicate through Kaiser's email system. What a, what a great, great way of, of doing this. You don't want to, you don't want to say in front of mom, mom, mom is, 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 is not an accurate historian, uh, but you're still queuing. You found a way around embarrassing mom to still cue her clinicians that, Everything she says needs to be taken with a grain of salt. Um, uh, great. And let me take one more, one last suggestion. Uh, uh, Leah says, I have a signal with my mom. So if she looks at me in the doc office, I, re I reinterpret what the doc said until she understands. Otherwise, I stay quiet until the end. So if my concerns aren't addressed between them naturally, I can bring them up at the end. Wow, Leah, you and your mom worked out a perfect, a really good system. So she feels like she's still in control. She she cues you, she prompts you to step in and, 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 and do some clarifying if she needs it. And then she, it sounds like she, she and the doctor leave you some room at the end so that you can bring up uh, some, of, some of your concerns. Sounds great. It sounds like you and your mom and the clinician found ways of working together. Okay, great. Let, let's go on. And, and I have a feeling that for some of you, the things I'm going to mention, you, you, uh, you've already come up with on your, on your own. But what I, I didn't hear <clears throat> very much in, in, in the comments so far is, the, is the, the, the T word. And the T word is trust. And, you know, it's something that almost is maybe it, we sort of take this for granted. But unless we build trust among the relationships that, in, that, in that triangle, then we really don't develop effective partnerships. So how do we build trust? So one way we build trust is by, by developing common goals. So one of the comments I saw earlier is that sometimes the way the doctor and the caregiver look at the patient is different. They see different things. Um, that may be true, but they had better be working toward the same goals. And the, the goal may be, a, a, a very broad goal, like I want my mom to stay well enough so that she can continue to live in her home, which is what she wants. Or it may be, uh, I want my mom to be able to walk at, at, you know, down the aisle for, at her granddaughter's wedding. It could be something very specific. But the goals that the patient has should be the goals that the, the, the clinician has and the caregiver has. The other thing which builds trust is clear roles. And, and this is where I think sometimes caregivers get, get tripped up because uh, they know what needs to be done at home, but they also, um, they also don't know, uh, you know, sometimes clinicians may accept, expect them to do more than they're willing to do. And sometimes the clinicians don't understand how much they're actually doing. And so for the, for the doctor to understand what the caregiver is willing and able to do, and also what they're currently doing that, that's very helpful. If, if, the, if the caregiver is there feeding mom, spoon feeding mom dinner every night, then the doctor needs to know that. If the, if the, you know, if the caregiver is, uh, is, not, is just showing up once a week you know, with a bag of groceries, that, that's a whole different role. And, and, the, and the clinician needs to understand that too. And here are you know, some other things that, that go into building trust, that there, there has to be means for timely communication. In other words, caregivers need to reach doctors when they need them. And that may not, be, may not be instantaneously, but has to be say within a 24 or 48 hour period. And so different doctors will have different ways of doing this. But if, if you write to the doctor or, or call the doctor because you're really worried about something, that doctor then better be responsive and reliable. And by the same token, if the doctor is concerned about something going on with, with the patient, with your loved one, then you better be responsive and you better be reliable because it's responsiveness and reliability that will really build trust. When there's 
tr responsiveness and re reliability and trust, then you begin having some really nice, nice outcomes. Then you start building mutual respect. You actually appreciate how caring the doctor is. You appreciate the doctor's skill. You appreciate the doctor really wants to make a difference. So you respect the doctor. And the doctor respects you, that you love your spouse, you love your parent, you want the best for that person, you're willing to, to really move mountains to make, make that person happier and to keep them safe. And the doctor appreciates all you're doing. There, there that mutual appreciation, that mutual respect goes a long way. And then when that's established, then there, there's, it, 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 there's almost always a sense of mutual support. That the, you're supporting the doctor in his or her role, the doctor is supporting you in your role. And then, then we have really the, the makings of a partnership. But, but as you can see, there are a number of steps to, to get there first. Uh, next, next slide, please. All right. So here, here are some questions for I think all caregivers to consider. And this comes, this is about developing that clear role that you're gonna to communicate to the, to the uh, healthcare provider. So what are you willing and able to do? And, uh, you know, sometimes people say at the beginning that um, they're willing and able to do anything, but over time they find that that's not true, that they have other family responsibilities, that, that it's something that, that is just so difficult that they, they're not willing to do everything, they're not able to do, to do everything. So this is something that caregivers need to have this conversation with themselves of what they're willing and able to do. But some things that doctors would be interested in, in, in knowing whether you're willing and able to do, are you able to observe, record, and report symptoms? So when you go to the doctor's office, you're sitting there, can you say, here, I, 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 you know, this is what I saw my mom doing, this is how she's been sleeping, this is, this is, you know, you gave her this medicine, this is how I see it affecting her. Can you manage a pill box? You know, if, if you, your mom is on 10 meds, um, it, it, you know, managing a pill box means you got to put the right meds in the right slots and then making sure your mom takes the right meds at the right time. Can you handle medical procedures at home? Does, you know, like if your mom has a feeding tube or your mom needs, needs uh, injections, it, are those things that you can do. And are you willing and able to advocate for your, for your mom? Can you, can you, you know, maybe go to bat for her? Can you be assertive if you need to be and say, no, that's not, I, I, my mom needs better care than that. My mom needs another answer. We need a second opinion. Are you, are you willing and able to do that? So I think these are things that caregivers need to, to be clear about uh, and bring those, those things to the table. Next slide, please. And then we need to make sure that the care receiver and caregiver are aligned because as you heard with my mom, we were not aligned and maybe with other, you know, for some of you, that's also the case that the care receiver has, an, has some idea of how this is going to go. And you have another idea of how this is going to go when you work with healthcare professionals. So in your conversation with the care receiver, what role does he want you to play? So I, I, I don't remember who said this, you know, getting the high sign from my from mom who then would say, would basically you had an agreement beforehand, this is what I want you to do at, if, if I don't understand something. I'm gonna give you the high sign and then you're gonna jump in and, and ask clarifying questions. That's, that's, that's the, the care receiver dictating what would be helpful for, for, for that care receiver. And that also means what, what, what doesn't, what, what does a caregiver receiver not want the caregiver to do? Does the care receiver not want the caregiver to rat them out, like I was doing with my mom, the, the, the not, not be there in the whole time, not manage the meds? Um, will, and then very importantly, will the care receiver give, give the caregiver access to all medical information? Um, and you know, certainly in the later stages of something like dementia, this is not an issue. But in the earlier stages, it is an issue. And there are care receivers who, in order to try to maintain control over their lives, then I, they, they, try to, uh, they try to maintain control over the medical information. And then they keep you in the dark about things and make it more difficult for you to do your job. And then will the care receiver allow you to take part in the medical decision-making? Or will they say, butt out, this is my life, not your life. You know, I, I have to do what I think is best. And in some time, some cases, it is 
appropriate for a care receiver to say to say you know an older adult to say to an adult child this is my life not your life i've got to i've got to take care of this so let's just take one or two comments um uh yes and so andrew says but what is what if care caregiver has cognitive impairment is in denial and i'll give you the short answer to a very complicated issue andrea so the answer there is um if 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 the care receiver still has the legal right to make decisions for themselves, then um, they have the legal right to provide you with access to information or not provide you with access to information. If the healthcare professional determines that um, your the care receiver is not uh, does not have the capability any longer to make uh, to, to make medical decisions, then they would go to they would look at the healthcare proxy. They would look at um, Whose power of attorney, they would look to family members to step up and, and play a role in, in receiving medical information and in the medical decision making. But, it, but that's a, you know, dementia, particularly in the earlier stages, can get very complicated. Um, and, and JG points out a lot of legal questions vary from one state to another. And that is, and that is true. So I would recommend you, uh, if this comes up in, in your state, that you look at what, what, what opportunities, what, what resources, legal resources are available so that you can uh, research what are your, what rights as a family caregiver do you have to medical information and medical decision-making for someone who's cognitively impaired? Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So here is something that I recommend, and this is, you know, I, 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 what I write, write up here is I come in peace is, is sort of, a, you know, again, a joke. I don't actually expect you to walk into a doctor's office and say, I come in peace. But the idea here is, and I, I'm, I'm a believer that if you walk into a doctor's office, kind of bristling, you know, loaded for bear, you know, ready to jump on the, on the medical professional because you don't like what he or she is doing, believe me, they're going to get defensive in a hurry and they're not going to want to work with you and they're going to want you out of the room as quickly as possible. On the other hand, if you come, if you approach saying, I want to work with you, I'm here to help you help my loved one, then I think the healthcare professional will say, great, you're, if you're here to help me help your loved one, then let's, let's work together. And this is, um, and part of this is, you know, we have to work out all the confidentiality that you, you need to get the patient's permission in front of the, the professional to talk openly. And then you, you, what you're doing is you're really offering yourself as a partner of care, a partner in care. And that, my hope is that if you if you make that, uh, it's almost like an invitation. You're saying, doctor, I'm here for you to help you if, if you need me. Then, then doctors will be gracious enough to say, thank you so much for the invitation. And by the way, I'd like to take you up on that invitation. And let's see how we can work together. There will be some healthcare professionals say, no, thank you. I'm fine working without you. But I, I think um, it's, it's the foolhardy healthcare professional that does that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then along the same lines is not just, um, I want to help you, but how can I best help you? And so different doctors have, have different preferred means of communication. Some want you to work through the EMR portal. Uh, they want to have all communication through that. I've worked with doctors that only want you to text them, only want you to email them, only want you to phone call them. Or they don't want to be, dis be bothered in between medical appointments with your loved one. They just want you to show up at the next medical appointment. So I, I, I recommend you actually say, um, what's the best way for me to reach you? How would you like me to communicate with you? And the doctor will say, you know, here's how general people generally do it. It usually seems to work best. Why don't you try this? And then I would ask a doctor, what type of information would be helpful to the care that you're providing for my loved one? Would you, do you want to see, you want me to bring in the, the blood sugar or blood pressure readings? Do you want me to keep a food diary? Do you want me to do, observe the behavior and keep, keep a recording of, of, of the behavior? Would that be helpful? And then, I, I, you know, especially for patients who are cognitively impaired and can't really speak for themselves, it's very important as a caregiver for you to share with a doctor what, what you know of the patient, who they are as a person, and actually what matters to them. And that, you know, if, if, for instance, staying in their own home is more important than anything else going on, then, then that should be, you know, what the, what the whole medical treatment is focused on. So, all right, ne next slide, please. 
end. As long as we're having this conversation about what, what I can do for you, by the way, here are some things you can do for me. So what it would be really helpful for me is if you, know, if you gave me some resources that I can really understand about my loved ones, Parkinson's disease, their cancer, their, you know, their, their congestive heart failure, their dementia, you know, is there, is, are there websites you recommend? Are there pamphlets that you have? And maybe you know, if my, my loved one's taking chemotherapy for, for their cancer, could you, do you have some information about that that I can read? I'd really wanna be better informed. Um, I would really love copies of all the medical visit notes so that I can share those, those, those notes with other family members. The first instinct of family members will be to kind of freeze, but the whole culture of medicine is changing now and there's been a bigger push to sharing notes. And the fact is the patient has the right to the notes. It's not the doctor that has the right to the notes. And if the patient agrees to give you the notes, then you should have the notes so that you can better inform uh, other family members of what's going on. And then, you know, as I said, uh, what would also be helpful for caregivers is to know exactly how to be helpful. You know, one of my favorite sayings is not all help is helpful. And so what would be helpful to the doctor? And then in terms of medical decision-making for the doctor to offer you and the patient, not just one option, but multiple options, because there's always more than one option in medicine. And then how do you provide input to the treatment plan? So it's not just telling you the, telling the doctor telling you, what, what, you know, what he wants you to do, or what he wants the patient to do. It's not just a doctor dictating the plan. The plan should become out of an of a ongoing conversation and partnership. Um, uh, so that means uh, that you can say how to, you know, with the patient permission, I'd like, I'd like to offer you my opinion about what the treatment plan would be. That, that would help you feel like, a, like a, not just a trusted partner, but a valued, valued partner. Next slide, please. Okay, and I'm gonna go through this quickly because I wanna make sure we have enough time for, for some additional comments or questions. What does the well-planned medical visit look like? And, and I have a feeling many of you are already well-versed in this. So before you go into the doctor's appointment, you have a conversation with the patient about what are we trying to accomplish today? What's the agenda? What questions do we have? In other words, you go in prepared with a game plan. You don't just go in and let, let the things kind of meander or, or even let the, the, the doctor decide what the game plan is going to be. You go in with your own game plan. During the visit, you're there as a recorder of information. You're, you're, you're taking notes. You've also brought the, the questions on a pad. I've seen doctors, as soon as I see that pad, they grab it out of the family caregiver's hands and they said, let me look at that. And they, they want to go down that, the questions on that pad as quickly as possible. And that during that visit, it's, it's your job as a family caregiver to maybe kind of prompt the, 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 your loved one to raise issues that are concerning if they forget, or maybe raise them yourself. And then after the visit, I would do a kind of debriefing. Let's, let's talk about what the doctor said. What did you hear? What did I hear? What, you know, what, what are the, you know, we have, we have a handout here we're gonna take a look at, but does this make sense to you? And then when they get home, if, if there's a new medicine to be taken, if there's a new procedure to follow, then uh, they're gonna go over this together. Um, and, um, you know, Joe says, I'm just gonna address one question here because it really does, does come up and does drive me crazy. Joe says, how to work around doctors who say dementia is a normal part of aging. Uh, and, and, that's, uh, and, and that is, you know, in a, in a word, baloney. Um, dementia and, and normal aging are quite distinct, and and, and then uh, you can get into you. I don't think you need a doctor to, to you know to, to uh, no doctor is going to block you from getting a, a referral to to a neurologist or to a, a geriatrician who could make an assessment for for uh, for dementia. And uh, what I would do if a doctor is giving you a hard time, I would send something in writing, an email or or a uh, or letter, basically saying. I believe my loved one has dementia. I'm requesting this, this, and here's the evidence for that. And I'm requesting a referral to a specialist to assess my loved one for dementia. There is not a doctor in the world who would deny you that because uh, they, they will, you know, with something in writing in the chart, they could be legally liable if in, in the event of uh, in, 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 if something occurs in the future. So once it's in writing, they have to, they have to spend uh, time uh, they, they have to really uh, give you what you're asking for. Lisa Jean says geriatricians and geriatricians are wonderful docs. 
and um, I, I think if, if you can get your loved one to be seen by a geriatrician for all their care, that's terrific. There are not enough geriatricians in the world, however. Uh, so if your primary care doctor is not comfortable doing an assessment to, for dementia, a geriatrician can function as a specialist to the primary care provider and do, and do that assessment and then send back a report just like any other specialist. Next slide, please. All right. Now, let me, let me just offer uh, uh, you a couple of, a couple of uh, questions here. Uh, we're going to do this really briefly. Are there any ideas that jumped out at you that seem either helpful or not helpful? What, is there anything here that you heard that I offered you today that you might actually try on your own with your own loved one? Um, okay. Uh, loved access to notes, not just test results for sure. Uh, any other ideas uh, that I, I said that you liked or didn't like? Um, uh, I think Lisa is a very fast, Lisa Jean is a very fast typist. And so she gets her comments in very quickly. Um, all right, Joan said, I would like more info for working with the staff of a nursing home. And um, I'll just say very briefly, Joan, having done this myself with both my step, stepfather and mother, you get more bees with honey than vinegar. I would bring the plate of cookies on a regular basis and I would make sure that you are their friend. And then uh, they will treat your loved one better. I hate to say that. Sometimes you gotta bribe them with a plate of cookies, um, especially homemade cookies. Uh, they, they, uh, but it, 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 most of these folks um, are, are feeling very beleaguered in their jobs, often beleaguered in their lives and, and the kindness you show to them make, makes a difference. Okay. Um, how to advocate when not physically present due to COVID protocols. I would say, Monica, what you put in writing, which you, you know, is, is, it will always have more power than what you say verbally for legal reasons. And, and so I would have, uh, I would put something in, in, in the mail or via email, because that will be required to be in the chart. And that, that would be the best way to advocate. Um, okay, let's, let's wrap up. Uh, next slide, please. All right, here's, here's the, the end of the story on my mom. Um, we worked out a compromise. Uh, I would attend the first few minutes of the session with her, her primary care doctor. I would give my report of what I was seeing and express my concerns, and then I would leave. And my mother would then have her visit alone with her doctor, which is what she wanted. And then before my mother would left the, the exam room, the doctor would come out and get me out of the, out of the waiting room and, and bring me into his office and say, here's what I'm seeing, here are my concerns anything that, you know, here's what you can do to be of help to me. So we worked out kind of splitting up the time so that my mom had time with the doctor. I had time with the doctor. I got to say, speak my piece. My mom got to speak her piece. That seemed to work, create a, a better, uh, better way for the three of us to work together. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, common goals, being interested, building trust. This is the way we become valued partners of the healthcare team. Um, uh, next slide. And I, I don't think we have time for further questions or comments. Next slide. Uh, so here I am. You had no idea on this, this, this bald-headed guy in, in the Philly area, but here I am. Here are the two books I've written. Uh, and now let me, let me turn this over to, uh, to Calvin to, to close us out. Thanks, Barry. Um, we we're actually very happy to have him uh, come on the line. I don't know if you, um, any of readers of Connections will notice we get his uh, articles in as, as frequently as we can. So we're very happy he's able to spend a, a good chunk of his time with us this afternoon. Um, and of course, I'd like to thank you all for participating in today's webinar. Um, we know you've got a lot of a lot going on with your caregiving responsibilities, so we really appreciate you um, taking the time out. I'm going to get a little bit of a, a short poll started. But um, before that, um, I just wanted to mention that next time we'll be covering um, tips on how to boost your emotional health during the pandemic. And uh, you can find more about our webinars on our website, caregiver.org. Also, for those who wanted to know if this will be recorded, um, it will. We'll get it up um, in a couple of weeks and it will be on our YouTube channel, um, which I believe is caregiver.org. Um, all spelled out in YouTube. But if you go to our website, you can find an easy link to our YouTube channel, which has this webinar and um, the previous ones we've done. 
So again, um, before I get the poll started, thank you very much, um, Barry, for um, joining us today. Thank you, Calvin, and, and, and thank you all for the good work that you're doing with your loved ones, and keep up that good work. Perfect. Thanks so much. So again, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, I've got the poll up, so you can provide a little bit of feedback if you'd like. Um, and I wish you all a good afternoon, a good evening, and uh, take care and be safe.